Uh, my name's Nick. Um, I work at a place called Middlesex University. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about a thing called ROS, Robot Operating System. How many people have heard of Robot Operating System? That's good, because I was going to start with a general introduction to what Robot Operating System is. So I'm not going to waste my time doing that, other than for those four people. Um, I'm not primarily a roboticist. Um, I've kind of slipped into it. Um, I spent most of my professional career kind of finding that I was quite interested in something, playing around with it long enough till people would pay me to do it, and then look at that over there, that looks interesting, and going and doing that instead. Um, so that's kind of how I've slipped into robotics. Um, so I teach a bit of robotics, and I play around a bit with robotics, but it's not my full-time job, I teach other things as well. Um, we use ROS quite a lot to teach robotics, um, and I'll introduce it to you, tell you a bit about it, um, and particularly talk about TurtleBot towards the end, which is the sort of reference platform for ROS that people who are starting up can use, and it will pretty much 100% work, so you know that if things are wrong, it's something that you're doing rather than the robot that you've built. Um, ROS was originally created by a group called Willow Garage, um, which was an American company that was set up by a guy called Scott Hassan, who was an internet person who made a lot of money from selling a web company. I can't remember which one. Um, but he decided that robots were probably going to be one of the next big things. But what he was interested in was robots that actually did stuff in a commercial space, potentially in a residential space, rather than robots that worked in a factory. Um, and he was interested in building sort of commercial applications that you could sell robots doing. Um, which usually at that point people stopped calling them robots. They started working on a, a big thing called the PR2, which was a big two-armed robot that could move around, and they started building a code system to work with it. And one of their observations from looking at a lot of robotics research and development that happened was that people spent a long time building a robot, and they tended to build a code system around the robot that they were building, and if they had a research project, it was maybe funded for three to five years, they would spend a couple of years building the robot, getting all the code running on it, implementing all the architecture for it, and then the money would run out. And so then they'd start building another robot. And for that new robot, they'd build a system implemented to get all the bits to talk to each other. And they would constantly re-implement stuff. And so every time you looked at a different person's robot, you had to look at code right down at the low level and work out how they decided to get things to talk to each other. And so what they started to do was to build a system that would facilitate that and make it easier. Um, I'm not a big fan of PowerPoint, so I tend to have just a bunch of web pages open. Um, tend to be a bit chaotic when I present, but you'll just have to bear with me. Um, having said that, I have got a bit of a presentation here that I will whiz through some of. So, what is ROS, or Robot Operating System? Um, is that big enough? Can people see that? Particularly at the back? Is that okay? Yep. Um, it's actually middleware. It's not an operating system. But Robot Operating System was too good a name to get in the way of that. Robot middleware system wouldn't sound nearly quite as interesting. Um, and so it's a kind of meta operating system that sits on top of an operating system and provides robot specific stuff. Things that are generically useful for robots. Um, it's often called plumbing for robots. So the idea is you've got a bunch of sensors that are going to detect something, you've got a bunch of actuators that are going to do something, and you need some way to link them up. And if you can make that generic as possible, stuff will be as reusable as possible. So it's a collection of packaging, software, and building tools. So they also define ways to make code, compile code, distribute code. But they're not reinventing the wheel. They're using stuff that already exists as much as possible. So they're using things like CMake, but they've got build scripts for CMake so that stuff gets automatically built in a workspace that you create. And they've defined an architecture for distributed inter-process, inter-machine communication and configuration. Okay, so a 
into process. There's lots of different things going on. As soon as you start building a robot that's fairly complicated, you've got lots of things that are going to be happening simultaneously. All kinds of stuff going on. And so you want something that has lots of processes running. And so they've used a fairly common architecture for doing that, just having a whole bunch of bits of code that talk to each other. And so they've defined a way for getting bits of code to talk to each other and have extended that so that it will work across machines as well. Because a common thing that happens is you start building your robot, you, you make it more and more complicated and you suddenly find that the processor that you're using can't deal with all the stuff you're trying to do. And so it's very easy then to move some of those processes onto another machine that's connected over a network and they pretty much automatically then carry on working. It's just a couple of lines of configuration. It's language independent, so it's not a programming language. Basically, all your programming code needs to be able to do is send messages and receive messages in the way that Ross defines, and then it can take part in what's going on. So you can do that in pretty much any language if you want to do the hard work, but primarily Ross uses C++ and Python. So C++ tends to be for the lower level driver stuff and the really computationally intensive stuff. And Python tends to be for the higher level stuff where you're kind of saying, go over there and when you're there, tell me. Okay, so what is, what is ROS not? I've already kind of let the cat out of the bag. It's not an operating system. It's not a programming language. It's not a programming environment. You can use whatever programming um, IDE you want. It's not a hard real-time architecture. What's, does that, what, um, do people know what a hard real-time architecture is? Hands up if you do. Okay, that's not many hands, so I'll very briefly go through it. So a hard real-time architecture is when you've got code running and some electronics doing stuff, how important is it that it does it in a defined time? Is it deterministic? Uh, and a good example of something that you might be familiar with that would probably be a hard real-time architecture is the airbags in your car. The system that controls those, it has a very, very hard limit about when that system needs to respond to an outside event. The outside event is your car's just hit a wall. What's the hard real-time constraint on that? Deceleration. Sorry? Deceleration. D what? I, I've got a much, much simpler metric that I'd test it by. Has my head hit the steering wheel yet? If my head has hit the steering wheel, then this hard real-time architecture has failed. And it's a hard real-time architecture because failure of it is catastrophic. It means that the system didn't work at all, not just that the system was impaired. And in fact, the test for that isn't your head hitting the steering wheel because if if just as your head gets to the steering wheel the airbag goes off what does it do it then gives you whiplash yeah. so the real constraint is your head getting about halfway to the steering wheel at which point you want the bag to have inflated so ross can't do those kind of things because it's this distributed inter-process communication system and particularly once you then started floating that off onto separate machines you can't make any hard promises about how quickly things will happen. The good news is that that often isn't a problem apart from some very, very specific points in your robot. And what you do is you build a very small bit that's doing that and that talks to ROS. So you keep the real time bit as small as possible and you don't rely on ROS to do that. Okay, but what does it get you? So it gets you, they tend to talk about universe and main. OK, the main bit is the general tools for distributed computing, the way that you send messages between processes, the way that the processes advertise themselves to the system. And then on top of that, there's a whole of, load of robot-specific stuff, algorithms, frameworks, hardware drivers, robotic apps. The general tools for distributed computing, they're maintained by, well, they were maintained by Willow Garage. Willow Garage doesn't exist anymore. They closed it down, and 
moved on to other things, and they set up a thing called the Open Source Robotics Foundation, who continue to maintain it. Um, and they look after that small group of tools, and they deliberately keep the main bit of ROS as small as possible. And the universe is done by pretty much anyone who's interested in doing stuff. And that's a whole range of people. Some of them are companies, some of them are, some of them are research labs in universities, some of them are just individuals who maintain a couple of nodes and share them with the community. So what does ROS get you? It gets you all that stuff that's maintained and developed. It gets you all that stuff. Sorry, I meant to go on. That just jumped back. This is why I hate using... So the OSRF maintained the packaging and build tools, the communication infrastructure, the ROS API and language bindings, and the introspection tools. The introspection tools are a really, really useful bit because the natural state of a robot is what? Natural state of a robot is not working. Okay, it doesn't matter how much you prepare it, how much you think it's ready, as soon as someone else looks at it and you turn it on, it probably isn't going to work. And so finding out why it isn't working and fixing it is a really, really useful thing. And ROS has a lot of tools that enable you to look at what's going on while the robot is still functioning. So you don't close it down and then try and pick it apart. You can interrogate the system while it's running. And then on top of that main infrastructure, you get a whole bunch of libraries Capabilities and applications is generically what they talk about. And there are specific libraries that are very robot-centric. So there's one called the TF library. I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. That's really, really useful. OpenCV, people are probably familiar with. It's one of the big open source um, vision libraries. Uh, for a while, Willow Garage maintained it. Um, and now OSRF maintain and look after it. Um, PCL. Point Cloud Library, that's really good at working with all the data that comes out of RGBD cameras. So things like connects that give you the distance away that lots and lots of dots are, as well as what colour they are. Um, they also have libraries that do simulation and a whole bunch of drivers that talk to hardware, which is really, really useful. Again, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And then on top of that, you start to build capabilities that sound a bit more like the kind of things that robots do. So you're interested in grasping, picking things up, identifying something that can be picked up, what's the correct way to approach it, have you managed to get it, where are you going to put it? And those things are still non-trivial. Things that we find very, very simple, robots find incredibly difficult. If they're in a factory, it tends to be very, very constrained and they just pick things up where they've been put so the robot knows where they are. In a space like this, a robot would really struggle because these chairs move about, the people move about, the people don't all look exactly the same. And so we're still struggling with that very, very top thing. Applications. And fetching beer is a common one because that's what lots of people who write code like to do. Um, Ross also provides you with a big online infrastructure. So there's a website, we'll look at that a bit in a minute, um, where you can download the code, you can get support, there are forums, um, there's links to teaching materials, to books, all kind of stuff like that. So when we talk about the communica communication infrastructure, in ROS we talk about ROSCore, and you run a process called ROSCore, that launches a thing called ROSMaster. And ROS Master keeps track of what processes have been launched, how they communicate, and what information they're in, interested in receiving. Does that using a centralized XML RP server, RPC server, and it puts nodes in touch with each other. So when we talk about a bit of code that's running that can communicate, we talk about nodes. And they will try and talk to other nodes. And the ROS master keeps track of which nodes are probably interested in talking to each other and putting them in touch with each other. There's a parameter server, which in effect is global variables for all those nodes so that they can look at a single bit of data that's usually about 
the robot itself. And ROS out, which is a network-based standard out to send human readable messages so the robot can tell you things that are going on. And then in terms of the, the computational graph that gets built, we talk about nodes, parameters, topics, and services. Nodes are processes, so they're a bit of code. Could be written in Python, could be written in C++, could be written in other things. And they produce or consume data. They could do one, they could do both. If they do neither, then they're not part of the ROS infrastructure. So they won't have any kind of impact on what's going on. In order to communicate, they use topics. Topics are asynchronous, many-to-many -many communication streams that happen in one direction. So you either publish or subscribe to a topic. You can have multiple publishers, multiple subscribers. And it's asynchronous, so something can start publishing stuff without there necessarily being a subscriber that's listening to it. Something can subscribe to a topic, and there isn't necessarily something publishing to it. And that's really useful because it means you can bring stuff up in incrementally. And you can launch bits to test them without having to launch everything at once. And then services are built on top of topics, which is something where you might ask a question and want a reply. And so it ties two topics together so that you publish something on a topic and you get an answer back on another topic. Some of the introspection tools, while it's running, you can ask it to draw you a graph of things and how they're connected, so that you can check that things are going as you expect. Once you get to the point where you're launching lots of these nodes, it becomes a pain to launch one after another, so you can create a thing called a launch file, which is a list of these nodes and how you want them to configure to each other. So you've got topics, which is a stream-like communication, like me talking to you at the moment. Hopefully you're all currently subscribing. I'm publishing. When we start asking questions, you'll start publishing, and I might subscribe to them. You can have one or more of publishers and, and subscribers to a topic, and things can subscribe while the system's running. It's a, a continuous, ongoing process. Services provide a function-like communication, and then you have... Actions which are like long-running processes. So you might tell the robot, I'd like you to try and navigate over to there to this location. And it's going to take a significant amount of time. So you don't want to block in code and wait for the reply to that. You want to sort of regularly check and say, how are you doing? And an action provides that. So it's like a service that isn't going to reply very soon. And so you probably want to go away and do something else while it's doing stuff. Rossmaster coordinates all this. So we've got two nodes here, one called camera, one called viewer. When camera launches, it advertises itself to Rossmaster and says, I'm going to publish on a topic called images. It's going to be a stream of images that come from the camera. So Ross adds that to its list of topics that exist on the system and makes a note of that's a node that publishes that topic. Viewer launches and says, oh, I'm, I'm called Viewer, and I'm, I'm interested in subscribing to topics that are called image, images. And so, Ross Master puts them in touch with each other, and then they start to directly communicate with each other. So it isn't all going through the master, because that would be a huge bottleneck. Images start going over, they get to Viewer. Another node gets launched, and it says, I'm interested in images as well, actually. And so it gets them too. We've got a lot of graphical user interface tools that enable us to visualize the data that's on topics so that we can see what's going on. And we can visualize images while stuff's happening. And we can visualize stuff in 3D space. The robot, the data that it's getting off the sensors. Ross is sent out in distribution, similar to Ubuntu. 
And Ubuntu is the main operating system that it exists for at the moment. Um, there's some experimental work about getting Windows running on it, but mostly that's just been to get a particular sensor to publish data into ROS. They haven't implemented anything like the range of stuff that exists under Ubuntu, primarily because most of the build stuff is stuff that works in Linux. I won't talk too much about actions for now. I'll talk a little bit about coordinate frames. So, mention a library called TF. That's a library that works out trans transform frames. So, transform frames become very important when you're talking about a robot because what you're usually interested in is the end, end effector maybe on the end of a robot arm. And we're interested in the position that that is and the orientation of it. Where is it pointing? And we're usually interested in that in relation to something else. So if a robot's got two hands, it's interested in where this hand is in relation to that because it may want to grasp something. What the transform frame library gives you is the ability to just say, I'm interested in this hand and that hand. Can you tell me how far apart they are? And the transform frame library will go, yes, at the moment, they're this far apart. OK, can you tell me how far this hand is from that top right shoulder? And it'll go, yeah, they're this far apart. And the way that it does it is that you need to have a description of the robot. And a robot is described as consisting of links and joints. So it, if I describe my arm in terms of links and joints, the links are the bits that potentially can move. Sorry, no, the joints are the bits that can potentially move. And the links are the bits between them that are fixed. A joint might not move, it might just be where somewhere's connected. So you can describe a fixed joint. You can describe a joint that rotates in one plane, a joint that rotates in two planes, or a prismatic joint that slides in a linear fashion. Once you've described your robot in this way and you've put that onto the parameter server for ROS so that the whole system can see it, the transform frame library can then use that to calculate where things are. In order to do that, it needs to know things like, what angle is the joint currently at? So you then need some nodes that are using a sensor inside the, the joint of your arm to publish information about what angle that's currently at. And the transform frame library amalgamates all that data and starts to make higher level sense of it so that you can ask questions like, where is this hand in relation to that hand? All you need to do is define your robot in the way that Ross describes and publish the sensor data for the joints that move. Transform frame library takes care of the rest. In terms of robots, that's quite a big chunk of work that it's doing for you now. And you end up with quite a few coordinate frames. It handles it all. The one sort of limiting thing about it is that your robot needs to be described in a particular way. It needs to be described as a tree. So there needs to be a single base point and everything radiates out from that. And some robots can't be described in that way. So a delta robot, which is like three arms coming down that moves a thing around, that can't be described as a tree structure because there's links that are joined in parallel. That's a limitation of ROS. So you wouldn't use it to directly control a Delta robot. You could potentially send messages to the Delta robot from Ross to tell the Delta robot how to move, but its internal control wouldn't be done using Ross. And the system is distributed, so there's no single localised area that is producing all that transform data. It's uh, something that emerges out of the nodes that you have doing various things. The library kind of coordinates it. That's probably enough of that, and it's kind of run out. So Ross has been around for about 10 years. Um, this website tries to keep up to date with robots that currently work with Ross. Um, there's quite a few now. Each of those robots will have a different sort of level of integration with ROS. So some of them will use ROS right at their 
fairly base level to control the robot. Some of them may just have an interface that allows their robots to receive messages from ROS, and then internally they're running their robot however they want. Either work fine. Cancel frames. So they produced a robot that was the sort of reference platform for ROS. So this was the original Turtlebot. Um, what do you think the base is based on? Rumba. Yeah, it kind of looks rumbery. It's, a, it's the base of a, of a robot vacuum cleaner, but without the vacuum cleaner bit. It's got an ST32 inside there. It's got motors, it's got batteries, it's got a charging unit, and it's got various voltages coming out that are handy to plug things into. Originally, it was designed to have a laptop put in here because eight, nine years ago when these first came out, running it using a single board computer was quite hard. So you shoved a laptop in there and originally it had a connect on, which is an RGBD camera, red, green, blue and depth. This would look out into the room and produce data about where things were or data about distances to things. Then trying to work out what they are is potentially a very complicated thing. The description of the robot frame tells it where this camera is, so the distance data from here, it can then relate to other parts of the robot. Disadvantage of this, it was just over £1,000 to buy. Part of that was this base that was about seven, dollars $800. What's the, little aside, what's the most difficult thing for robot vacuum cleaners at the moment? You go, sorry? Well, yeah, stairs is a big problem, but in the, in the areas that they work. So if you go on the forums for robot vacuum cleaners, apparently, this, somebody told me this, it might not be true. Um, about once a month, they get a question mark on the forum saying, what do you do if you've got a cat or a dog? So machine learning, if machine learning could detect animal poo, the vacuum cleaner manufacturers will be very, very interested. Because at the moment, it can detect that the carpet's dirty. And so it drives over the animal poo and goes, oh, there's some dirt there. I better make sure I get it really, really clean. <laughs> oh, right, I think I've got it mostly off. I'll now continue to drive around the flat, <laughs> cleaning everywhere else. So machine learning, animal poo, there's a big opportunity there. So, one of the disadvantages of this base as well is that you didn't get a lot of information about what's inside there. So there was a protocol for talking to it, but in terms of the guts of how that base bit worked, you didn't get anything. So that was a bit disappointing. Um, they've just released, hot off the press, the new version of the TurtleBot, which is a lot smaller. That's deliberate because it's a bit of a pain having to transport quite big ones like that, particularly if you get something close to a classroom set of them. They take up a large amount of space. These are being sold for about 500 quid now, five, 600 quid. Um, and that includes this on top, which is a 360 degree laser scanner. So originally they used the Connect because the Connects were very cheap. And from that, they extract a line of data emulate a laser scanner. Computationally quite intensive, but your little device was cheaper. These, they've managed to source. They're not saying how, how cheaply they'll sell them individually yet, but they will make them available individually once they've done the initial orders of this. Um, they're using Dynamix or servos as the motors, which are nice little servos that will continuously rotate. You can control the speed, you can control the torque on them, you can work out their position, all kinds of nice things. And they've produce their own board for interfacing between the computer and the motors. And they've released all the details for it. They actually released all the details before they ship the boards, which is unusual. So they've got this board that they call OCR. Uh, OpenCR. So it's 
Got an ST32 of some description on it. I can't remember the very long number after it. It's got an IMU unit in there. So an IMU unit, inertial measurement unit, so it measures rotation, um, acceleration, um, and integrates those to try and produce an estimate of the orientation of the robot, um, which is a key bit of robots like this. As soon as the robot starts moving around, it starts to get lost. And if you keep track of how the wheels rotate to try and estimate where you are, you will still get hopelessly lost because there are always errors and those errors will accumulate. And so what you're constantly doing is saying, I think I moved this far. Can I just check using my sensors? Does that look about right? And can we kind of work out between those two where we think we are? And the IMU is really useful in helping with that. It helps you work out the direction the robot's pointing in. They are also going to make these boards available independently once they've satisfied the initial rush of orders for the turtle bot. The turtle bot's made out of these little plates that bolt together. Um, the 3D printing files for those were available before the turtle bots were, so you can print your own if you want to. If you buy a turtle bot, you get the advantage of them being injection welded, so they're a little bit stronger. Um, but all these bits will eventually be individually available, so you can source the bits that you want to yourself and build the rest. How long have I got? We're out of time. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, but what do you want to do? Uh, keep talking. <laughs> well, we've, we've also... I, I've, 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 sorry, go. I, I, well, I'll, I'll just do... I was going to do a demo of the, the LiDAR, but I won't bother doing that because that takes too long. What I will show you is, OK, so... This is a, a really nice story about um, somebody using ROS. OK, so this is a farmer in America who was on... He was trying to use the Navio to drive his tractor around. He was getting a bit stuck, and they said, oh, well, come, go and talk to people on the Ross Forum. So on the Ross Forum, started talking to him about... So this is his, some of his initial tests with his tractor. See the cables there where he's um, hacked into control it. His daughter assisting him, sitting next to him, critical bit of... Okay, so in the first instance he's able to press the game controller and get his tractor to drive forward. Now this is a big thing. In America, digitally controlled farm machines are not a new thing. They're available commercially. People hate them. Um, the prices of second-hand tractors and combine harvesters that don't use digital have gone through the roof as people try to buy them because they don't want to use the digital ones. Why not? Because they're closed source. And if they go wrong, there's nothing you can do with any of it without getting the distributor in to fix it. You can't hit it with a hammer. You can't tweak it. If you're in the middle of getting your crops in, that's no good. And so people starting to make their own solutions to that is a really, really important step. And open source stuff for moving tractors around is really, really exciting. So this was his first, first stuff that he got working. Um, and he was, he was excited. It's driving along. That's great. Um, so with a bit more, a few questions asked, a few people on the forum getting in touch with him. OK, can you, can you spot the difference between the previous video and this one? There's no driver. He's sitting on the mudguard of the tractor outside filming it. Driving along, and it's working. It's pulling the stuff behind it. OK, so he's, he's approaching a ditch which his grandfather crashed a combine harvester into many years ago. He's still sitting on the mudguard. It's lifted the, the thing at the back, so it's not doing tillage anymore. It's not dragging through the stuff. And then it puts it back down. OK, he's not happy with the fact that it's not going in a very straight line. What he needs to implement is things like PID control and an IMU unit. So he starts implementing those with help from people on the forum. And then he adds a, an e-stop using a feather, an Adafruit feather. 
so that if he isn't on the tractor, he can stop it. He's got three tractors now that he's set up to do this. Various questions going all the way through. Da -da -da -da. Da -da -da -da. Um, and he, he talks about he likes boring tractors. He likes boring robots because he just needs them to work. So there's the IMU, there's the PID working. And then right at the end here, right at the end, there's this thing. So I slogged through planting all of the corn, 535 acres, planted the soybeans manually, and then barely prepped for the AgBot challenge. So the AgBot challenge is university research departments, various commercial companies, going to a field and showing what their, what their robot tractors do, and he won it as an individual entering from his own farm. So that's the power of open source and stuff like Ross. I'll stop at that point then so that people can have some food.